Okay, so as I said, let's go down in size. We are a much smaller facility, even though we are national and the nation is quite big, but facility is small. <laughs> um, so I'm, um, I'm from Sweden, I mean, I'm from Italy, but I run the Swedish Cryon facility Stockholm node. Um, so we are placed at Silef Lab, which is actually a joined uh, effort from uh, uh, the three main universities in Stockholm, Karolinska, KTH and Stockholm University, and Uppsala University. And the idea is basically that the Silef Lab, um, uh, people would build, so there are built-in uh, facilities that would cost too much for any lab to have, and instead we then offer a national service. Um, okay. So, uh, as I said, so I'm going to mainly focus on our node in Stockholm, but actually we have a sister facility in Umeå, up in the north, and you'll see, I'll mention them for various things. We do a lot of the things in common. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, uh, so basically a SciLife lab was thought in such a way that uh, by the facility there will be uh, research groups that uh, so that uh, the um, technical aspect is not decoupled from the research aspects and so the main groups the main two groups uh, that are actually sitting in my life are Alexia Moons and Eric Lindahl's group but actually we have uh, um, another 15 uh, PIs that we consider uh, group I mean groups that we consider internal users at Stockholm University because the microscopes are owned by Stockholm University so um, this is the team. So Gunnar, he uh, put together the plan and, uh, uh, the, mm, and he managed to find fundings to, to start basically CryoEM uh, in, in Sweden. I mean, there was, uh, uh, there was uh, already a tradition of uh, normal time of cells and, uh, and 2D crystallography, but not really single particle. And so you'll see basically our aim have been mainly on training new users from scratch. And then me and Julian, we run actually the microscope. Stefan is uh, the uh, system administrator. Jose is uh, developing uh, together with the Madrid team, uh, Cipion, and, uh, and together with uh, Dar uh, Darian Bjorn in Eric's group, uh, um, efforts to put Reliant 3 on Cipion. Karin joined recently, she runs a spirit at Stockholm University, but she will be actually helping us. Uh, I just go quickly through the, uh, so I was involved in the, um, in, in the project before moving to Sweden, and basically we, we didn't have the opportunity to build, uh, to really build everything around uh, the, the facility, but we had space and we had to use that space. It's this triangle here. Uh, there was already a slab, a, um, a slab of uh, concrete where we could put the Titan cryos and uh, basically then the next uh, microscope, so the Artica was simply put in the leftover space. It's not on a slab, but uh, uh, Stockholm is built on granite, so it's very stable. Um, now, yeah, I want to say, of course, we have temperature and humidity control. We try to reach... Uh, uh, these values is here, 20 degrees and 30% humidity. In reality, we have problems in summer. Uh, the rest of the year, we don't have problems because the humidity in the town is actually lower than that, probably. Um, and then uh, you'll see, I mean, uh, I'll show you one slide later about the nitrogen supply that is the same that Dan just showed you. Um, so this was in... Uh, January 2016, when I arrived, there was basically an empty room. Uh, the microscope had been just delivered in December, and uh, as probably, probably many other places, we had to break a wall to put the Talos Artica in. And then, um, so in March, we were using the Artica, and in July, the Cryos. So initially for internal users, uh, but then uh, we, in November, so the time to organize the administrative infrastructure, we start in November to have the first national users. Uh, so, uh, yes, as I said, this is the liquid nitrogen refilling system that I was telling you about. So we also actually were not the first. We copied it from an installation in Montana. 
Um, there were already nitrogen tanks uh, for the hospital because uh, we, we are actually sitting at the Karolinska campus and there is a new hospital. And uh, then they had to build pipes under this street that fill up a tank of 60 liters that is in the ceiling of our Artica room. And uh, it's super convenient, actually. The, we never had problems uh, with uh, vibrations. We didn't have problem with the, so that the system for exhaust of the nitrogen gas works very well. We really, in two and a half years, we didn't have any problem. And also, it's very convenient because we have a tap, so we can uh, fill up nitrogen all the time. Uh, only problem sometime we had was a bit with the pressure in this tank. And so they wanted to put a camera, but instead I bought on Amazon a pair of binoculars, and it works very well, and we can check uh, that. Oh, very cheap. And so this is the uh, setup. I mean, you probably all know what the characteristic of a Talos Artican and a Titan Cryos are. Uh, just I want to mention, okay, they're both on XFAGs. Uh, actually, now I, I'd wish to have an SFAG instead, <laughs> to have less fringes, <laughs> probably in the beam. Um, they run on, um, I mean, we use mm, both EPU and serial EM uh, for data acquisition. Serial EM mainly for tomography. Uh, we, we use, we do all our processing in Scipion. We'll see more about it. Uh, then, okay, we have a Falcon 3 and the CETA on the Artica. We generally use the Falcon 3 in counting mode for, um, for data acquisition and, uh, I mean, in linear mode, of course, for screening. <laughs> And uh, on, uh, on, the uh, on the Titan, we actually have um, Falcon 3 and the K2 post uh, uh, energy filter. And I have to say, we very seldom use the Falcon 3. We basically used it only when the K2 broke. Um, yes. Uh, now, just uh, because really everything had to be put on from scratch. There was nothing whatsoever. So just, uh, I'll show you just a normal uh, auxiliary uh, equipment and one needs. And I have to say, we started with a glow discharge from, uh, from Pelco, but uh, I found it was not uh, strong enough. And so we actually then bought a glow discharge, a Q-globe, and works very well because you can actually make graphene oxide grids and, uh, and it's much more powerful. Now, Many, all of you that have a Pelcon, they pro you probably know that uh, it's very easy that this chamber chips and uh, it's super annoying. Uh, at, at the end, um, we came out with, uh, with a fix using dental paste that uh, people uh, in our light microscopy facility next door use. And, uh, and it actually works quite well. At, at least you can kind of like uh, build a ring, a rubber ring around the chamber and uh, it resists very well so that uh, I have always some left, I mean, some clean and proper um, unchipped uh, chambers, but in case they chip, they, they break, we, we just have this. Now, um, so what is the uh, peculiarity, I think, of our uh, installation is that, uh, as I told you, there was, there was basically I mean, in Sweden, there are not many um, screening microscopes around. I mean, there are microscopes for material science, but not many for, uh, for actually life science applications. So people really, there are many, many people that need to, to do screening. And they come with an Eppendorf tube, basically. And then we also have this, uh, this thing, so it was quite good because when the money was uh, uh, when we got uh, this uh, big bunch of money from the Wallenberg Foundation, uh, it was good because Stockholm University could secure half of the time for the internal users. So uh, basically we have half of the time is for uh, people from Stockholm University, and which we call internal users, and half of the time is for external national users, so people coming from all the other universities. And we really have people coming from Lund, Gothenburg, uh, I mean, mm, Linköping, uh, most, most basically of the other universities in Sweden. 
so what, what we do is that we book our time every other week for, uh, for external users. And, um, and then we treat the two type of user differently because there's no other way basically at the moment. So for internal users, we go through training so that uh, once they are ready and they can use the microscope by themselves, uh, they can uh, independently book on the booking system. Now we have quite long waiting time actually at the moment, um, like three months or so. And then uh, uh, national users instead, they apply through a national portal and uh, uh, they, I mean, I'll show you more the details of this. And, uh, and then, depending, so they can apply for both for screening or for data acquisition. And uh, when they apply for screening, yeah, we do generally the screening on the Talos Artica, and we are not very happy about it. <laughs> when they apply for data acquisition, it means that we have already optimized grids. And we're also very happy that uh, recently, uh, I mean, like six months ago, Umeo really started uh, full speed to take also national users. And so we, they sh we share the burden. Um, now, so for internal users, uh, the training, what does it consist of? So we are kind of like three sets of, of training. Generally, like mm, people train on their own sample. This way we can optimize the time and uh, um, we, we, choose, we show them how to choose grid, make carbons, make, make supports. Uh, plunge, of course, I mean, freeze. Sometime in the past, I mean, I should remove this. We did uh, a bit of negative stain, but it's not really, I find it's not really efficient on a, on a not loader system. And, um, and then we show them how to load a uh, thing on them into the microscope. Uh, then uh, generally this is what they learn, let's say, the first day. And then on the second, uh, on the second round of, uh, of training, they learn how roughly, I mean, the microscope parts and how to do very basic alignments. But, but we don't allow them to touch the gun, just to do basic pivot points, beam shift, and uh, comma correction with auto CTF. It's solid and uh, it's enough. Um, and then, yes, we, we show them how to use EPU or Serial EM. We also use EPU for, uh, for screening uh, without going through the whole process. It's very fast just to switch optics. And, um, and then we, uh, once, generally, once they've been doing this for quite some time on the Artica, internal users are very ready to just go on the, on the cryos and, uh, and just learn how to use the K2 with the energy filter. And then every year we organize an image processing course of one week uh, to teach them and also external users a bit, uh, I mean, some basics of image processing. Now, so this for internal users is quite nice. We have maybe mm, 40 to 50 people trained now that are, mm, they are um, independent. Uh, for, uh, for national users, we cannot really offer that yet because uh, the waiting time is too long. So it will take uh, too long for them to, in between one session and the next, to actually be trained. So at the moment, we do everything ourselves. Now, they apply through this portal. So uh, I have to say that the facility at the moment is national. This was bound to... Uh, the Wallenberg uh, funding we got. So we first, uh, our f first main goal is to, uh, to form the Swedish community. Uh, but you'll see later we have a lot of ongoing plans with the rest of the Nordic countries. And we actually hope that we'll be able to take maybe 5% of the time for also other, uh, I mean, people from whatever in the world. Um, so at the moment, as I said, again, uh, in the beginning, we were asking for some evidence of 2D classes and we realized it's really not possible. I mean, people have no possibility to do that. So all we ask for is for sample quality, homogeneity, monodispersity, basically some, any evidence that it's worth putting it on a microscope. Uh, so we, then we also have a system of application that uh, we copied from Diamond, basically, where we have 95% of the, 80% of the time of the microscope allowed to, uh, for bug, uh, bug time. This is because now we built enough uh, users from different institutions that they can join themselves into bugs. 
So we have five bugs. We assign time for one year, and we assign this time in between us and, uh, and Umeo. Actually, here there is Michael from Umeo that is sitting down there. Um, and, um, and then we have 5% of rapid access which is still so not, not quite the rapid access <laughs> because we assign time on the next quarter. Um, we charge users, we charge uh, uh, 5,000 sec, which is around 500 euros per uh, uh, 24 hours. Uh, but still, I think we are among the cheapest <laughs> facilities in, <laughs> in Europe. Um, we, okay. And, and then uh, the so rapid access also is only checked by me and Julian and uh, Michael and Camilla, but uh, uh, for the other application there is a scientific committee of ten people that they were appo appointed in the different Swedish university and they evaluate the scientific uh, uh, relevance of the project. So then these people come, and uh, I mean now. After two years of operation, it's nice we have people that actually have optimized grids. So hopefully, I mean, sometimes they don't come, which is actually much faster for us. We just set up the data collection. But, and actually we plan to, to also teach them how to collect remotely and, uh, uh, and hopefully have, um, have some kind of remote data acquisition. Uh, but if this, uh, the first time that they come, as I said, most likely they're not, they couldn't check anything because they didn't have any microscope to check on to. And so we have to do everything for them. And so and this is a typical uh, uh, screening day. So here you see the timeline on a day. And here you see our status. Our is me and Julian, where we start very energetic in the morning and uh, uh, it's we are dead in the evening. I would say honestly that unless it's really necessary, like in this case, I think the facility shouldn't be giving screening time. I mean, it shouldn't be an optimization thing. I mean, optimi optimization shouldn't be done at facilities, basically. So likely, everyone should have a smaller microscope where things can be optimized and then sent to facility. Because otherwise, it's not quite uh, a, an efficient use of good microscopes, I think. Um, anyway, it starts out like that, nine. What we tend to do is to freeze uh, eight to 12 grids. Now we are teaching some bug users at least this first step, but in general, we've been basically freezing quickly for them, and we tend to check two, three different concentration, and maybe grid with and without support. And then we put them in, and then by lunchtime, we screened most of them. We use EPU for screening, as I told you, so it's very quick just to switch optics and, and check three, four different areas in the grid with different eye thicknesses. Mm, then, uh, but then, if uh, everything went, I mean, if actually, if people were luck, lucky, uh, if we had luck, we, uh, we can start a data collection. So around four, then we can start uh, an actual data collection on EPU or, uh, or Serial EM. But uh, uh, if, uh, if we're not, <laughs> if we were not lucky, then generally we, we screen, I mean, we freeze again. We freeze again maybe four to six grids just to, to give them something. And uh, we tend to collect overnight, even maybe if the grid were not uh, perfect, just so that people can have a small data set to start playing with, because the next step is they also have to learn how to process. But uh, if not, I mean, if it's really not worth it, then generally they go home and the time mm, is taken over by internal users that have uh, ready grid to collect overnight. Um, for tomography, we do a bit the same generally. Mm, you collect maybe a couple of tomograms du during the day and show them how to reconstruct and then set up a, an overnight data collection. Here are some examples of just like, for example, a, um, an optimization that took five screening sessions of Talos from aggregated and falling apart to nice. And then this is another one, very Again, very aggregated, very invisible on carbon support, very preferentially oriented on graphene support. <laughs> and then finally, after a lot of more, um, more screening, nice sample. And then I'll show you a bit more of this project. Now, how do we put together all these uh, 
variety of things because basically we have internal users that have been booking in the booking system, external users that also been booking booked by us on the booking system, but that they had uh, some information about on the application portal. Uh, and the two microscopes. So what uh, Jose uh, designed is this session wizard that basically take, take information in from the microscope and from the uh, application portal and uh, uh, starts a session that uh, um, uh, generates out a correct uh, um, geography of the, of the folders for, uh, for data acquisition or, or simple screening and uh, it launch all the scripts that uh, are needed for, uh, for transferring data and uh, uh, set up a CPM project that we use for uh, on the flying data processing. Uh, the wizard looks like this. So you see, okay, he designed the two microscopes and uh, uh, whether the project is national, internal, or is one of us. Uh, said it's, uh, he put Scipion uh, and then none. This is not <laughs> quite true <laughs> because actually then we, uh, we have, so I have a Windows partition in our working station. And so if one wants can uh, run warp for on the fly data processing. So, Basically, this works like that. We have an operator that basically talks to the microscope uh, to a working station with this characteristic where we perform uh, uh, processing. We actually perform a part of the processing in the staging server where the data are, are also written. And then uh, a data server that is basically the same as the staging server is actually visible by external users and they can access using a password and just uh, retrieve their data. And that's generally done during the data acquisition already. They connect, they are synced to the institution because after 15 days, we delete the data. I mean, not so strict, but that's the policy. <laughs> um, now, this is our uh, setup and uh, uh, infrastructure. I mean, for, I mean, the IT infrastructure. I, I will really not go into details, but you can you can have this slide, you can ask, and then maybe you better ask Stefan <laughs> for more details. And, um, and now, yes, so as I said, so once you launch, launch your wizard, then you, you get asked what type of uh, pre-processing you want to do. But you'll see actually now we have much more. Basically, we go to, to, the, uh, classifi uh, to the classification and even 3D first model. And, uh, and so, uh, yeah, that's what we do so far. I mean, now by default, we go up to here. And in reality, for various cases, I go up to here the morning after. So I'll show you. Um, yeah, these are the protocols we use, basically. So generally, we use generally Motion Core 2. And uh, I tend to use GCTF for, uh, for CTF estimation. But you can choose whatever you want inside Scipion. And again, also for picking, the most used are this XMIP uh, supervised picking and uh, rely on uh, auto picking with Gaussian. And, uh, and then the 2D classification is done. Basically, from now on, everything is mainly based on rely on. And uh, now, uh, Jose with Bjorn and Daria are working on putting all the rely on, proto rely on free protocols inside Scipion. And uh, generally, the 2D is run on batches. So basically, you, you decide how big you want your batch of particles. So once you have extracted, say, uh, 20,000 particles, it, star it starts a new 2D classification. It is nice because not only it tells you you get your 2D classes to say good or not, let's go ahead or let's change, uh, let's change grid or <laughs> let's change user. Or, uh, <laughs> or it can be even like, I mean, give them user as in grid type. <laughs> or it can be also used because at the end, uh, each batch will be made of different extracted particles. So you, you can already put together a clean data set that you can continue from, basically. So yeah, this is how the, the, um, the 2D, I mean, the summary of uh, motion correction and CTF estimation look like. This is how a picking in XMIP look like. I find that it works quite well, actually. 
At the end, it depends a lot on the grid. Uh, and then this is, for example, an example of one batch of 2D classification. And then uh, if uh, one, uh, one, is in one of the operators is willing to spend uh, 15 minutes, maybe, you can actually go ahead and, uh, and even get a 3D starting model to give to the users. And so, for example, this was got in this case. Um, then, of course, this is only part of the data, so people will have to continue. And uh, in general, I mean, the, the reason why I, I mean, I personally like uh, Scipion is that in reality, I mainly run, rely on inside Scipion. But the good thing is that uh, you can really keep track. And so this, for example, how that particular user continue with her data processing and you can branch and, uh, and mix and match and as, as much as you want. This is finally what she got so far. So s I talked about single particle. Until now, I mean, this uh, ribosome mitochondria is what we look often at. <laughs> but we also do some tomography, and so we have something. And uh, we've uh, uh, of only a plunge frozen sample, actually, in Stockholm. But I have to say that in, in Umeo, they have actually a SIOS. They can do fib milling. And uh, so, yes, and I actually like to visit <laughs> and try. <laughs> And, and then we've also started to do some microD together with Jadong Zhu and Ong Ji Shu. And uh, also on simply on the CETA at the moment. Oh, this is just a diffraction. I forgot it was animated. Um, OK, so this is a tomographic example. So this. This actually, <laughs> I just put it here because it's kind of like a highway of uh, microtubules with a mitochondria here. And this is from intact dendrites that I froze using a manual plunger. And the, our manual plunger is the most basic thing. It's just gravity plunging. And, but it, it works very well for cells because you can blot on only one side if you want. And then, OK, so. Here are simply, I mean, some statistics of what uh, we've been done so far, and also in terms of publications. And, and then uh, I want to mention this. Uh, we have uh, this new Cryonet, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, initiative. And uh, it's, it's basically, uh, so we got funding from Novo Nordisk in, um, uh, in um, Denmark and from the Wallenberg Foundation in Sweden to put together the four uh, uh, nodes of cryo in uh, Sweden and Denmark. Uh, so Umeå, Stockholm, Aarhus, uh, Copenhagen. And, and we have uh, uh, money to exchange personnel, having a meeting among us, and um, organizing courses. And uh, yes, and so we can actually also fund some research projects if we want. So I think it's quite a good example of trying to now get also bridge towards <laughs> the rest uh, of Europe. And, uh, and, and we also want to extend to the rest of the Nordic countries, uh, Norway and, um, uh, Norway and uh, Finland. Um, so I, then I was saying, okay, for future uh, future plans is, I mean, we will um, uh, we, we we got funding to buy a um, to buy one of these uh, Spotiton or Chameleon or uh, Easy no Vitrojet. I always call it EasyJet. <laughs> and <laughs> where <laughs> anyway, basically to 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 buy a new uh, system for for sample preparation. Uh, yeah, then I'd be happy to hear your opinion about this, if you, if you could try any of this. And uh, yeah, and then we'll, f we'll, we'll put more effort on electron diffraction, actually. Um, OK, and then with this, I want to thank uh, uh, our, uh, our supporters, basically. I mean, the Wallenberg in particular, uh, but also Erlich Persson and the Campus Tilfersenna. They supported a lot Umeo, and uh, these people are the um, the H and M, you know, the clothing company uh, foundation, <laughs> and uh, Stockholm University, of course, 
and uh, all the actually all the research uh, group at Stockholm University because they are our internal users. It's very nice because their projects yeah develop fairly well, and uh, yes. Um, and then I want to thank actually our engineers because they are very useful. They are very very helpful, uh, Masanori and uh, Denis. And that's all. And Question about the screening. Uh, how successful is uh, one day screening? How often? It depends a lot, a lot from the project. On average. I have the impression how many that. Oh, five at least, I would say. Okay. Yeah. But it really depends a lot on the project. I mean, uh, you know, there are people that come uh, with ribosome with some extra factor. And those generally work fairly well because, of course, they, they might not know yet if they have a factor attached or not, but at least we can collect and then they can figure that out. Or, uh, yes, this type of thing. Uh, or uh, actually also some tomography projects, I mean, where people want to, for example, we had some extra vesicle or uh, some clathrin coating from ex vivo. I mean, this type of thing, because then you can collect enough tomograms on a screening day, and Talos works fairly well for that. And then you can have a, some if they can have some information. But... Yeah. Maybe I missed it, but how many users would you say you have anyway? So internal trained, 45, 50, and uh, external, I mean, users, uh, I, I don't know, projects we run maybe 100 projects, yeah. There's, uh, yes, there are various, like, like maybe five to 10 PIs in each bag, we have uh, five bags. And the training is on a and we one, one on one or? No, no, I mean, no, and actually, <laughs> Actually, from internal users, it also is happening more and more often that uh, some good PhD or postdoc trains others, and then maybe they ask for double-checking things, but it works fairly well. For bugs, uh, for, for bugs users, yeah, I mean, we would really like to, to start training them. I think, you know, Michael, what do you think about it? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, because... Is yes. Also from the online or just the it's a, it's a uh, no, no, it's it's uh, during data acquisition. So yes, yes, yes. yes. So yes. it's basically like we have 48 hour data collection, mm -hmm. and uh, after 24 hours, you you have 2D classes or more if you want. So but only on. Uh, yeah, because then comes the next user. So that's so. What we do is this: that part of the pre-processing is done on the staging server, and so basically we occupy four GPUs per data acquisition. But then, once your data acquisition time is finished, also your pre-processing time is finished. So of course, you you don't get all your data set pre-processed; only part of it. Also, also online. online, yeah. I mean, if online for if online means during the acquisition, yes. On a subset, of course. Sorry, last oh, question. Okay. Do you offer any services then for users to continue processing the data, or do they have mm. to look them themselves? Okay, so officially no, but in reality yes, <laughs> because I mean it's a bit of a pain if if. if it's a bit of a pity if something is working. You don't want to just, hey, ciao, <laughs> drop after all the effort, you know. So often people, I mean, if they can, if they are in Stockholm area, they come back. But not really. We don't sit with them. We, we don't have the human power to do that. So what we do is that we, we help um, them, like, OK, I think that at this point you can try A, B, C, D, try classifying this way, try this mask, this type of thing. But then they have to do it themselves. 